Um, the title of my presentation, Inequality, pro Poor Growth and Development Policy, uh, I think the mere fact that I'm presenting on this topic uh, is due to Howard. Um, while I was a PhD student at the University of Sussex in the late 1990s, I, I happened to be in the right place at the right time uh, when Howard was looking for a research assistant um, to help him with a, uh, a paper he was writing on pro poor growth. And that paper uh, was subsequently published in 2001 in, De in Development Policy Review uh, with the title Growth Versus Distribution, Does the Pattern of Growth Matter? And it went on to become very uh, widely cited and, and influential. Uh, probably for Howard, this was among, maybe it was um, among his sort of top 20 or top 30 most cited articles. For me, obviously, it's been my, my probably top cited article. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, and I, I became used to being referred to as Anderson, as in White and Anderson. <laughs> but uh, it, did, it did, however, inspire me to try and capitalise on, on, on its success by, by carrying, trying to carry on uh, working in this area. Um, and although my, my subsequent efforts haven't met with quite the same amount of success, it's certainly been a very interesting area for me. Um, so what I wanted to cover today are, t are sort of two main things, really. Um, First, I wanted to talk about evidence, um, and I wanted to kind of argue that I think while there is now quite a lot of good evidence about um, the adverse effects of inequality and, and about the importance of pro poor growth to poverty reduction, um, it's less clear uh, what the evidence is or what the evidence tells us about the actual policies and interventions that can address inequality and that can promote uh, pro poor growth. We seem to think we know what works, but do we really have the evidence to back this up? Um, and the second thing I want to talk about is I, I wanted to share some reflections that from two systematic reviews that we are doing uh, at the University of Anglia on, on these issues. Um, we are aiming to uh, provide a more rigorous and systematic review of the literature on, on the effects of government policies and interventions on, on inequality and pro poor growth. So I wanted to share some reflections from those, some early reflections from those reviews. I think that this is uh, quite timely because actually when, when Howard asked me, when I worked for Howard as a research assistant, one of the things he asked me to do was to write a brief literature review um, summarising what, what the evidence shows regarding the determinants of pro-poor growth. Um, and I think I, I sent him a couple of pages of text um, which summarised the, the results of a handful of studies that I happened to have come across. Um, in, a, in a couple of papers that, I've, uh, that someone passed to me, I think. Um, there wasn't anything particularly systematic about my search, I, I have now to confess. But uh, it's perhaps quite timely then that finally we've um, had the chance to return to this, this task that Howard set me over, over ten years ago and to try to, to do a more systematic uh, review of the literature. So. Uh, let me start then with some of the, some of the evidence about um, the adverse effects of inequality. Um, I think um, going back a, while, a few decades now, there is a large literature that is highlighting some of the many adverse effects of, of inequality on socioeconomic outcomes. I'm, I'm talking mainly here about income inequality. That's really the focus of my uh, work in this area. Um, rates of, on adverse effects on rates of economic growth. Um, also, as Kunal mentioned, um, adverse inequality, higher inequality often tends, there's evidence that it shortens the duration of economic growth spells, you know, the importance of looking at the dynamics of growth. Um, also, uh, low, countries higher inequality have lower levels of income. Uh, East, the paper by Bill Easterly makes that point. Um, also, evidence shows high inequality countries have a lower rate at which growth translates into poverty reduction. Um, tend, to ha tend to have lower uh, ter secondary and school, uh, tertiary school enrolment rates and also ev there's evidence that higher inequality is associated with lower average levels of happiness. These are some of the messages that are coming out of the, uh, of the empirical literature um, and obviously uh, this, this evidence is not conclusive. Um, there's some exceptions to these findings. Um, Canal talked about there is some evidence that inequality might be uh, actually positively related with growth in, in the short term. Um, it's only when we look at sort of maybe over the longer term that we see the negative effect. 
Um, there is that evidence. There's also other people who are, who are just generally sceptical about this type of cross-country evidence. But personally, um, and I think many people would agree that um, there does seem to be some qu quite robust and consistent evidence about, about this adverse effect, uh, these adverse effects. Now, well, but one um, recent paper that's attracted quite a lot of attention um, is a paper that came out this year by uh, Jonathan Ostry et al., um, who, as Kunal mentioned, has done quite a lot of work in this area. And this, this paper was actually, I don't know if you, many of you have read The uh, Guardian yesterday, it was actually mentioned in the, uh, the Ar Guardian editorial um, because, quite surprisingly, this is a, a, a working paper that's coming out of the IMF that is actually advocating redistribution which is not, not a, a message we often associate with that, that organisation. Um, now, I think the interesting thing about this paper is that it differs, it differs from previous research in that it simultaneously looks at the effects of inequality and redistribution on growth. And that's, that's important because the two things can often go in, the, in different directions. Um, men, some people have argued that high, the reason that high inequality is bad for growth is because it leads to, leads to more redistribution. High inequality countries, there's pressure for more redistribution. And it's that redistribution that then leads to lower growth. Um, and that gives rise to sort of rather, um, can give rise to negative sort of policy implications. Inequality is a bad, it's, it's problematic, but if you try and do anything about it, that will make things even worse. But uh, I think the interesting thing about this paper is, is that it shows that inequality is bad for growth, um, but uh, redistribution doesn't actually seem to have any correlation with growth. Um, so this is just the results of, of their regressions, and here's the inequality variable uh, with this uh, negative coefficients showing a negative effect of inequality on growth. And then here is the, the, redistrib the measure of redistribution that they use, and there is essentially no empirical correlation here. So. You know, I think this is, an, this is an interesting new sort of contribution to the, to the evidence, um, suggesting that group inequality is bad for growth and redistribution doesn't nec won't necessarily make things any worse. Um, so let me, um, obviously we can, we can maybe come back to talk about that, that evidence later. It's not, obviously it's not, full, it's not uh, completely uh, foolproof. And, um, but I think it's interesting to point out. Let's now, uh, let me now move on. Oh, sorry, this is just a, a, a graph that sort of shows those same results um, in terms of, this is the kind of the effect of inequality, and then this is the effect of redistribution, very sort of uh, little, small effect, direct effect of redistribution. This is the effect of inequality on growth. So if you add those two things together, the overall effect of redistribution on growth is, is actually uh, positive by, by reducing inequality. Um, okay, so now let me talk about um, the second area where I think we've also got some quite good evidence, um, and this is about the importance of, of pro-poor growth to poverty reduction. This is actually something that um, I think was one of the major contributions of, of uh, White and Anderson. Um, because one of the things that we did was that uh, we decomposed uh, growth in the, uh, in the incomes of the poorest 20% of the population into a growth component and a redistribution component. So growth component is, you know, that's the rise in average income. Redistribution components, that's uh, increases in the share of the poorest 20% in national income. Both of those things can contribute to a rise in the incomes of the poorest 20%. The question is which one is more, is more significant? In, in practice in recent decades. Well, what we kind of, our central message was that, um, yeah, clearly, uh, growth is the kind of the, the most important driver, um, but redistribution is, is a still a significant uh, factor. It's certainly non-negligible, and we, sh we, in particular, we showed that in over a quarter of cases, it's actually more important than, than growth in average incomes in explaining why uh, the, the incomes of the poorest 20% are, are rising. Um, now, I think looking, having had a chance to look back at this, I think um, subsequent research has actually um, backed us up on this point. Um, 
more recently, a more recent paper was done by um, Art Cray at the World Bank, who um, Canal also referred to, which this was a very, it was a very uh, comprehensive study, and it mainly differed from ours. It actually looked at um, absolute pos poverty measures. We would have been mainly looking at relative poverty measures. This looked at absolute poverty uh, measures using World Bank uh, poverty lines. Um, and the kind of conclusion that came out of that paper was, I think, rather similar. It says, for, the, for a sample of all spells, so spells of poverty reduction, periods of time um, over which poverty changes are measured, between um, 43 and 70 percent of the variation in changes of poverty is due to the growth component, with the remainder due to changes in relative incomes. So that's changes in relative incomes is what, essentially what we are referring to as redistribution. So I think, you know, that to me is, a, is arguing pretty si similar to what Howard, uh, what White and Anderson had also argued, that redistribution is a significant factor, even if perhaps not the, the, the main factor, but certainly st uh, significant. Um, I just, this next table shows uh, the results from Cray's paper in slightly more detail because I think you can put a different spin on these results depending on what kind of message you want to um, get across. I think... Um, many people have uh, focused on this figure up here. Um, well, you can't really. This figure up here, the 97%, is if we look at uh, long run changes in poverty. And if we use the, um, the poverty headcount as a, as a measure, which is obviously this is the most widely used poverty measure, that, and it's often the most widely quoted in policy discussions and so on. But if you, if you were to take a sort of a, uh, a theoretical approach to poverty measurement and a, an axiomatic approach, this is not actually considered to be a very good poverty measure. Um, so careful actually what I say here in front of Howard, who's uh, the expert on this, but I think the Watts index uh, it would be considered in axiomatic terms to be a much sort of better measure of poverty than uh, the headcount. And if we were to look at these figures on the bottom, we'd find that the growth component the, the ability of growth to explain poverty reduction is, is in this case, much much smaller, and leaving a very significant uh, share that's explained by redistribution or, or changes in relative incomes. So I think, um, you know, White and Anderson broadly uh, proved uh, re subsequent results have been consistent with um, our sort of message there. And I think that message is an important an important one um, because it, it went against the prevailing wisdom at the time. That uh, the prevailing wisdom at the time was that distributional changes were either too small or too slow to be relied on in practice as a means of uh, poverty, reducing poverty. Um, the view was that large changes in income distribution only really happen in periods of um, fundamental political or social change. In revolutions or war, uh, following wars or revolutions, for example. But I think our results were showing, uh, showing that was very actually wasn't the case in practice. And I think, as Howard argued in the paper, uh, it's actually the fact that the record of growth shows distribution hadn't played a great role uh, is actually, at least in part, a consequence of the fact that people <coughs> didn't believe it could play a big role. It was, there was a sort of uh, a vicious circle uh, in operation, perhaps. Um, now, the third piece of, the third uh, source of evidence I wanted to talk about is, well, what do we know about, then, the policies, um, interventions for reducing inequality and for promoting, uh, redis for promoting quote, or growth, for promoting a pattern of growth in which, um, which is conducive to poverty reduction, in addition to, uh, over and above the effect of simply average incomes rising. As I said at the start, um, we, we seem to think we know what works, um, but do we really know that, do we really know that uh, what, is, what really is the underlying evidence base? Now, this table here is actually taken from um, an article by Tony Killick. Um, now, when I joined uh, ODI in 2002, um, ODI had actually been had sort of launched a research program on inequality. Uh, so Simon Maxwell, who was director of ODI at the time, was quite very keen on, on to work on inequality 
And actually, uh, one of the reasons that I, I was recruited was because they thought I was an expert on, on inequality <laughs> following my work with Howard. Um, but Tony Tillich wrote a, a nice, really nice briefing paper for ODI on, on specifically on how to address inequality. And this was the sort of list of policies that he, that he came up with. And I think it is a nice kind of characterization. Um, and, and this is obviously only one kind of, sort of <coughs> list, but I think you'll find similar kinds of um, similar sorts of tables or, or suggestions for policies in, in various other kind of uh, documentation that you'll look at about, about pro-poor growth. Um, but what, what really, do we really know that these, these things work in terms of uh, promoting pro-poor growth or reducing inequality? Well, Tony Killick himself, uh, uh, towards the end of his review, he actually said, well, uh, although we can identify a, no a substantial number of instruments, um, none of these, or not all of these, are of great proven potency. Um, I think he, by that he was, he was sort of suggesting that the evidence base is not always that, um, that solid. Um, in White and Anderson um, also were slightly uh, cautious about the, the sort of any policy recommendations that we could draw from our, from our paper. Uh, we said distribution matters, but unfortunately our understanding of the determinants of the pattern of growth is weak. Uh, perhaps our major finding is about how much is left unexplained. We tried to do some empirical analysis, well we did do some empirical analysis that, that tried to look at whether measures sort of, of, of government policies were correlated with the pattern of growth. Um, but you know, I, I think we would admit that our results weren't uh, particularly strong in that uh, aspect of the paper. Few, few significant uh, correlations or, or coefficients. And our Cray's paper that I talked about earlier also made a kind of similar point, suggesting even that we might be looking in the wrong place. Um, Cross-country evidence is unlikely to be very informative about the policies and institutions that are likely to lead to poverty reducing patterns of growth. Perhaps uh, more micro level and case study research would be more useful if we want to sort of answer this, answer this question uh, to find out the determinants of distribution or change. So I think, um, I think there is this, in contrast to those two other bodies of evidence I talked about, I think there is this uh, more uncertainty about what we really know, what the evidence base is with regards to policies and interventions for addressing inequality and promoting pro-poor growth. So this is where uh, I turned to the, the systematic review. Um, one of the things that, uh, one, of, one of the questions that uh, White and Anderson posed was, uh, a, well, the simple one, simply to say what policies promote um, pro-poor growth as opposed to growth per se. And as I mentioned at the start, um, we have at UEA we have embarked recently on two systematic on two actually two systematic reviews that are on quite closely related questions. Um, the first one is uh, what policies and interventions have been strongly associated with changes in in, in country income inequality. And question the, uh, the second one is what policies and interventions have been strongly associated with the translation of growth into reductions in income income. Policy? This was, this was uh, I think it was in late last year that DFID announced a call for nine, nine systematic reviews in total. And these were two, two uh, reviews that were taken from that list of nine that we uh, uh, bid for and we were awarded the contracts for these uh, two systematic reviews, which, as you can see, are actually quite closely related in a way. Um, so... Um, these two uh, reviews are ongoing, um, so I don't have the uh, final results to show you, but I did want to kind of share some of uh, reflections on the process that we are going through in, in preparing these uh, reviews. Um, what is it we're trying to achieve? So, first of all, we are trying to simply map the available evidence um, about the evidence that seeks to evaluate the effects of government policies and in, interventions on either income inequality or the translation of growth uh, into poverty reduction uh, in low and middle income countries. 
I think um, those sy the systematic reviews are uh, quite broad. As you probably guessed from those questions, they're both very broad questions. So simply just trying to map the evidence is, is certainly uh, an important um, task for us in each case. But going beyond the mapping, we are interested more um, fundamentally in trying to establish if there are particular types of policies or interventions that we can kind of say with some confidence that tend to either reduce or increase in income inequality or the translation of economic growth into positive action on average. So you know, if we look at across a range of different studies or studies of different countries, studies using um, different time periods, can we say that there are some policies, interventions that do seem to work uh, on average? as opposed to just simply in, in one or two specific cases, perhaps. Um, if we, uh, assuming that we will find quite a lot of heterogeneity in the results of uh, the evidence that we look at, how do we explain that heterogeneity? Is it because studies are using very different approaches to measure these uh, effects of government policies? Um, or is it that they are, is it the effects differ across countries between low and middle income countries, for example? And, and then also if we, uh, if those first three tasks weren't, weren't difficult enough, um, we thought we would uh, set ourselves another, ch another uh, challenge, which was to try to understand better the process and mechanisms through which uh, government policies and in interventions affect inequality or the translation of growth into poverty reduction. Um, we have been uh, embarking on a, um, our, our screening process of the literature, and, and obviously for that it's very important to be clear about what our... Um, inclusion criteria are for our, for our systematic reviews. So um, I'm sure I don't need to explain to you how important the uh, inclusion criteria are if, if to, for doing systematic reviews. So we are, population is obviously, lim we are limiting our, our search to low and middle income countries at the time of interventions. We are also uh, restricting our outcomes, our outcome measures, very much to income inequality or income poverty. Uh, measured using some uh, recognised summary indicator of inequality or poverty. That, um, that actually excludes quite a, quite a lot of, of papers. I think the, the third point is around study designs. This is one of the biggest challenges that we've kind of faced is, well, what really counts as evidence uh, in, this, in this area? What counts as evidence about the effects, showing the effects of government policies on inequality or profile growth? Um, in the end, we've kind of narrowed it down to four, four main types of evidence. Um, the first one, what we call ex post quasi-experimental studies, is uh, mainly uh, econometric studies, um, um, of which the majority are cross-country econometric studies. Um, certainly, this is not an area where there you find uh, randomized control trials um, when you're looking at income inequality uh, at the national level. But we, there is a lot of cross-country econometric evidence, and a lot of that does use of sort of quasi-experimental uh, techniques, panel data, instrumental variables, and, and so on. But we didn't want to kind of limit our, our review to uh, econometric studies. Um, so we're also including uh, what we call ex-ante <coughs> simulation studies, and that includes uh, CGE models. CGE modeling has been used widely for analyzing the impacts of government policy reforms on, um, on income inequality and income poverty. And we thought that it would be interesting to include that in the review and, and to be able to compare the results of those, that sort of evidence with the results from econometric uh, literature. We also uh, include uh, case studies, uh, either quantitative or qualitative case studies, but with certain kind of uh, qualifications um, because there are huge number of case studies done on inequality and profile growth, and if we were to include them all, we would be, in it, we would be overwhelmed. So we only allow certain types of case studies, either that use decomposition an analysis uh, uh, that sheds light on uh, a certain uh, the contribution of uh, fiscal re redistribution to uh, income inequality, for example, or qualitative studies which draw on primary data. Um, and to to make ourselves, um, because it rapidly became clear that we were having too much, uh, too much study, too many studies coming in, we have set a rather arbitrary cutoff date of 1990, um, and also we are excluding 
um, certain types of publication, certain publication types like PhD theses, which were actually incredibly time-consuming to, to go through. Um, now, this is just uh, some brief, briefly, very briefly, two last slides, just to give you a sense of what we've been coming up with so far. We've, we started out with over, uh, for each review, uh, over 10,000 uh, studies to screen, um, and we have gradually sort of been whittling them down um, by excluding ones that don't meet our inclusion criteria, to where we're left uh, currently with around uh, 200 studies for the income inequality question and, and around 100 for the uh, income poverty question. All of which use, we believe, one of those one of those uh, study study designs to look at the effects of government policies and interventions on um, uh, either income inequality or, or the translation of growth into poverty reduction. Um, and we've also been trying to just map these studies. So, so when we when I talk about the mapping, we're simply just trying to, in a descriptive way, just uh, what what type of studies do we find? Well, so we've, we're kind of grouping our studies according to those four main um, types of study designs, if you like, um, or, or the methodologies used. And also looking at the types of policies that each, uh, that each study is looking at, because our questions are, don't, don't refer to any specific uh, policy intervention. Unlike most systematic reviews, we'll ask what is the effect of conditional cash transfers or uh, school, fee, school fees and things like that. Ours are actually saying, well, it, uh, just what policies? You know, so uh, obviously what for the mapping, it's important to categorize which uh, type of policies are, are being looked at in each study. And what we are currently doing at the moment is, is Sort of the actual, when it comes to the actual synthesis of the results, we're not going to try and do everything because it's just too much. So we're going to focus probably on one, one or perhaps two of these specific, more specific policy areas to actually see whether you get any consistent findings across uh, countries or across, across studies. So I think uh, just to end, um, Howard's paper, uh, well, uh, our paper, I should say, uh, mainly Howard's, uh, so uh, the most pressing questions are thus, uh, which policies affect the pattern of growth and are these policies favourable or harmful to overall growth? Now, I think it's very important that, uh, I think the important point being made here is that these two questions are obviously closely related and you need to ask them both at the same time really. Um, well now, our review that we're doing are, are trying to answer the first of these questions more systematically. Um, the second question, uh, is perhaps maybe we need another systematic review for that one as well. But uh, I think I'll leave it. Leave it. That's leave it for there. Thank you very much.